I can remember all the way back in seventh grade, uh, I had a hermeneutics class with Mr. Rusty Laven was the name of my teacher back in seventh grade. And I remember very well that class because he, uh, he had us doing some hermeneutical exercise, ex exercises. And the exercise that he had us do was to bring a fresh Bible that had never been used to class before, along with a pack of colored pencils. And we were supposed to go through all the gospels and highlight with colored pencils various things that we noticed in the text. So parables were purple, illustrations were blue, application was green. I mean, it was kind of like this primeval hermeneutics that we were doing, flowing from the primordial soup of these little seventh grade brains. But it, it was really a very helpful exercise because it got me into the text, working with the text, making observations about that text. One of the things that he had us do was in the margins of our Bibles, we would write with red colored pencil, the, the acronym UDK. Whenever we saw anything that didn't line up with the way we would expect it to be here in our world, we were supposed to write these three little initials, UDK, and those initials stood for upside down kingdom. All right, things that, that, uh, things that are true about God's kingdom that are not also necessarily true about the world in which we live. And I remember going through that exercise in that class and getting down to Matthew chapter five and the margin of my Bible just exploding with UDK, 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 all in the margin. Because when you get to the Sermon on the Mount, what you find there is a text where there is a tremendous distinction where Jesus is explaining the nature of God's kingdom and, and what he expects from his disciples and their activity and their behavior in that kingdom. And it's nothing at all like what we would expect it to be based upon our experience here upon this planet. The kingdom of God, the lesson that I took away from that class, was this. It doesn't operate according to the principles of the world around me. And my place in it isn't what I think it will be. And the Sermon on the Mount is a great place for us to look and find that message and that lesson together. It, it really is a picture of reality as God sees it for a people who are seeking to live in an unreal world. And nothing about our experience in this world matches up with the expectations that God has for his people. You see, the way that, the way that this world thinks does not square with the thoughts of God. And if we're thinking like the world, then nothing about the way that God works or what he expects will look like what we think it should. We must see things the way that God sees them. Now, as you get down into the book of Matthew, you'll find that, that chronologically, as you come into the passage of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is facing massive opposition in Jerusalem, and he strategically withdraws into the region of Galilee. But in the book of Matthew, the events are not really arranged chronologically, where, where Matthew glosses over the chronology, and he pulls together in Matthew chapter 4, three seemingly unrelated undisconnected random events. And he, in Matthew chapter four, stitches these three things together as the intro to the Sermon on the Mount. And the question that I think we must ask as we look at Matthew chapter four, knowing that it's introducing what follows in Matthew chapter five, is why? Why is Matthew organizing his thoughts thematically? What is that theme and what are we to learn from that theme? Matthew is very distinctly trying to, to prove a point in the arrangement of the text as he arranges these stories and these narratives just before he gives us the account of the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's organizing his thoughts thematically, but what is the theme of these stories? And if you look at this passage, Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 25, you'll find that Matthew is weaving these stories together in a way that mirrors the message of Jesus' sermon. They're all about the distinct way that God works from what we would expect him to be doing. Jesus goes to an unknown city in a backwoods region. He calls unusual followers, and then Jesus begins to do unexpected things. We, we find here in this text these, these three distinct scenes that all check the reality for those who are paying attention. 
And in the process, they set the stage for the Sermon on the Mount where we find out that nothing in the kingdom of God is as you would expect for it to be. And the reason that I want us to turn our attention to this passage together this morning is because this really, I believe, is a critical realization for those of us who have been called to a life in ministry. God's kingdom, your place, and therefore your work, it is different, and it is distinct. And everything from the message that he has given you to the people to whom he will send you, the people he will use to the impact of your ministry, it will be unique, it will be unexpected and uncommon, where he will use people that that you and I would never have chosen. He will do things that we would never have anticipated. He will direct us down paths in ministry that we could never have dreamed. And he will do it all to the glory of his name and his name alone. I mean, just think for a moment. He called you into his service. And right there at some level, just on the merit of that fact alone, you already know that God works in unexpected ways. You've, you've seen that in your life. But, but before we complete our studies here at this seminary and embark into his service, I think it's important, even as we set up the foundation for this school year, for us to have a bit of a reality check together. Because it's a recipe for ministerial failure to work for the Lord, but to fail to think like him. It's a recipe for failure to work for him and to think like the world. You see, we must align our reality with his reality. And here in this text, we find these these three scenes that demonstrate the distinct way that God works among his people. First, I want us to look together at verses 12 through 17, where we find that God sent an unexpected message, an unexpected message. Look right there at the text. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in a shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, as we look through that, this first scene together, we're going to find that what Jesus is doing here is not at all what the people there in that day expected him to do. Let's look first there at the fact that the location of the message that he brings is unexpected. He goes to the town of Capernaum, right? And as you know from your Bible geography classes, that's a small little fishing village about two miles west of where the upper Jordan enters into the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's right up against the shoreline. And, and archaeological studies tell us that there were as many as perhaps 10,000 people there who lived there in Jesus' day. It was a, a thriving fishing village. But it was by no means a major metropolitan center. And you can, you can still go there to this day. You can still stand there on that seashore. And in fact, I'd encourage you to take advantage of that, of that opportunity and do that on one of the Israel trips that we offer here through the seminary. There is no place more profound than standing there in Capernaum on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, where it is quiet undisturbed by these massive cathedrals. It's, it's pretty much the way that it was in Jesus' day, where there are these lazy little waves that lap the shore, blue, blue water stretching out, mountains surrounding the sea on all sides. It's a warm, dry, dusty spot. But what will strike you most about that spot is how quiet it is. It's very quiet. This small little village is where Jesus retires and begins to preach and proclaim to these people a message that they did not expect to hear. The location of this message is is unexpected. And the people of that day could not believe it when they heard that he was coming from Galilee. They say in John 7, 41, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? We have to ask ourselves the question, why Why this place? This is kind of like a, a modern-day lobbyist traveling to Des Moines, Iowa. No offense if you're from Des Moines. But traveling to Des Moines to change, to change the president of the United States' mind on some major public policy. Why would you go this way? This seems to be the wrong direction. It was unexpected. 
but it was God's plan. Because you see, back in Isaiah chapter 9, there had been a prophecy that was made where we're told that the Lord would begin to establish the kingdom by demonstrating that he wasn't going to do it in the way that they expected. He was going to do it in the way that the scriptures prescribed for it to be done. And everyone in his day expected him to go to Jerusalem to bring his message, but instead, instead he does it in Capernaum. He does it in a place that is next to nowhere. He does it in a place that is a, a tiny, sleepy, little fishing village, but a place that's in direct fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. Verse 14, this was, he went there to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, where the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The location of this message was unexpected. And as you keep going down into verse 16, you find that the audience of the message is likewise unexpected. Jesus doesn't go to the scholars. He doesn't go to the powerful. He doesn't go to the rich and the famous. Who does he go to in verse 16 according to the prophecy that was made? He goes to those who are clueless. He goes to those who are hopeless. I mean, look at the prophetic description of the people of Capernaum that would be true in the day of Jesus. Where does he go? He goes to a people who are, who are sitting in darkness. He goes to a people who are deluded by their blind hearts, to a people who are depraved in the depths of their souls, who are despondent without any clear hope whatsoever. And the emphasis there in verse 16 is on their hopelessness. And there, in that unexpected, out-of-the-way place, talking to people who were completely ignorant, the light dawns. And the result of him standing there is that light dawns upon them. The sun is now up, blazing over a land that for centuries had existed in darkness. The back half of that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, is the famous messianic prophecy that promises an eternal king who would reign forever, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an eternal father, a prince of peace. You see, their king had come, and he came to a place and a people that showed the very reality that God does not work like we expect him to work. His priorities don't match up with the priorities of man. If you look at verse 17 and zero in on this, I love what it says there in verse 17. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach. You see, it was there amongst those seeming nobodies, these Galileans who were despised because they weren't connected in any meaningful way back to Jerusalem and the religious ruling class largely mixed with Jews and Gentiles, fishermen, shepherds, tradesmen, people of really filth and honest living, despised by the self-righteous Jews. And it's here, it's here that Jesus begins to preach to them. See, the location of this message is unexpected. The audience is unexpected. And, and as we keep going, we find that the impact is unexpected as well. That word there, preach, in verse 17, it's, it's the classic word for preach, keruso. It means to be a herald of something, to, to publish something, to loudly proclaim something. It's, it's the announcement of something that is certain and real. And the message that he gives to them is as unexpected to them as it is powerful for them. The message, the heart of it, were the words that they longed to hear. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Reality had come to these people if they would but listen. But the way by which that kingdom would come that was unexpected because they glossed over the first part of Jesus' message, repent, and skip straight to the second part about the kingdom being at hand. But that word repent, it was, it was opposed to what they expected his message would be. They, they missed that word, and, and Jesus begins to reveal to them that the kingdom of God begins within the human heart, and only after it's taken, heart in the, taken root in the hearts of men can it then physically manifest itself in the literal kingdom that will come someday. And these people, they chopped off that first half and wanted to jump straight into the second. And I think the lesson that exists here in this text as we watch the way that Jesus organizes his message to these people, the place where he chooses to deliver it, is a reality check for us as well. Because God's kingdom, it does not work the way the world expects it to. You see, the message is foolishness to those who are perishing, and those who deliver it will likewise be deemed fools. And that is a critically important piece for us to recognize. 
The message that Christ brought was not the message that they were expecting. The message that you bring will not be the message that your people are expecting, and that is by design. And we must never forget that. To forget the divine design of the message that is given to us is is to fall prey to the temptation to begin to, to tweak it, to adjust it, so that it will satisfy the desires of those who hear it. And this cannot be the case. We're told that the message is given the way that it is given on purpose. 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. And the base things of the world and and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. What's that passage telling us? It's telling us that when you step out into ministry, there can be no adaptation of the message because it's uncomfortable. There can be no conformation of it to the expectation of the culture. There is to be no theological innovation to suit the need of the moment. No modification in order to make your ministry more compatible with the passing fads. You see, we are men who serve the king. And the message of his kingdom is and always has been countercultural. It always has been unexpected in its impact. And that is on purpose by divine design. As, as you think, if you think that God is going to, to work in the way that the world expects him to, you will be sorely disappointed. And that's the reason why Matthew puts this text where he puts it just before the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't come to the right people in the right place with the right message. Instead, he came to the people God sent him to with God's message. And so too will you. If you believe, men, that you can blend your ministry with the culture and fulfill your calling as a minister of his gospel, then you will be sorely mistaken. If you try to approach the kingdom work from a humanistic, rationalistic mindset, if you try to go where it makes the most sense and do what makes the most sense and, and say what makes the most sense, you'll be sorely disappointed. Because the message of the text here is that God does not work in the way we think he'll work. You see, God does his work amongst the lowly, the hopeless, those who sit in darkness. He doesn't do it in the way that we would expect it. His kingdom, his expectations, his actions, his commands, they don't line up with the expectations of what this world has. They're distinct. They're unexpected. So as you go out into ministry, do not take the stinger out of the message Proclaim the truth and do so unapologetically. The message that has been entrusted to you is the way it is on purpose. And if God made it that way, do not change it. We find here in this text that God works by giving this unexpected message in an unexpected place to an unexpected people, and the impact is very unexpected as well. This is the way God works. He has given to us a message that seems on the face of it to be utter foolishness to anyone who's thinking with a rationalistic mindset. But God did that on purpose. So don't shy away from the strangeness of the message. Instead, be faithful to do as our master does here in this text of verse 17, where he begins to preach. And he simply lays out the whole counsel of God. Repent, for his kingdom is at hand. God's given an unexpected message. The second narrative that we see here, the second theme, the second scene, tells us that God then used unusual people. Verses 18 through 22. Right away, we see that the nature of his followers was unusual. Verse 18, now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, And Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two older brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. 
Immediately they left their boat and their father and they followed him. We ask ourselves the question, why is this text where it is arranged here on purpose by Matthew thematically? It's because Matthew is further highlighting the point that God doesn't work the way we think he's going to work. Look at the people whom he's chosen. He's chosen these very unusual people. Their very nature is unusual. They are fishermen. Now, if you go to Galilee today, there's there in the museum on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, a, a place, it's really a tourist attraction, and it's called the Jesus Boat. It's, it's a boat that was discovered, it's from the first century AD. It was discovered back in the 1960s and 70s when there was a great drought, the water line receded, this boat appeared out of the, out of the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and they proceeded to dig it out of the, of the muck and they restored it and preserved it, and it's now enshrined in this giant building, and you can go today there in Galilee and see a true fishing vessel from the very first century. And right away, what you'll see when you walk into that museum is a giant map that's up on the wall of that room. And the map is a map of every piece of wood on the entire boat. And they've diagnosed and assessed exactly which pieces of wood were original to the boat's construction and which pieces were patches that were added on later. And for all the pieces that are patches, they've actually gone through and, and assessed what kind of wood has been placed in that spot as a patch. And the amazing thing about that map is that that boat is filled with holes. It's filled with patches, right? Where, where they would have to patch that boat, they did it at least a hundred times as they were trying to get that boat and keep it in repair. What that reveals to us is that being a fisherman was really hard work. They had to patch the boat over and over and over again. This was, this was hard work. These men were men who worked with their hands, right? And you look at this text and these are the men whom Jesus is choosing. The very nature of them is very unusual. These, these men, they were not total strangers to Jesus. Jesus had run into both Peter back in John, John chapter 1, verse 35 and 42, while they were the disciples of John the Baptist. He knew that he was related to James and John, and, and these men were not total strangers. And the important piece of notating that here in this text is that because Jesus already knew these men, he knew what they were made of. And he knew that these men in and of themselves were not world beaters. These were not the kind of men that you would go and find and, and trust with a task like go change the world. These were not those kind of men. It's not that these men were ignorant or stupid or illiterate. They weren't, but they were rough and tumble. They were hard workers. They were strong. They were vibrant, but they were anything but the elites. They were not worthy to stand in the court of a heavenly king or the court of any king. They were just normal, middle-class guys. The nature of these men was very unusual. Their occupation is also unusual. You see in the text here that, that Jesus catches them in the act of casting their nets. And, and what he's talking about there really is a, a small circular net of about 90 feet with weights, and it was meant to be thrown out and let out so it would drop down and, and catch the fish. And, and they're, what they're engaged in here is a, a well-established industry Josephus tells us that in the first century, there were 240 fishing boats that actively worked on the Sea of Galilee. But what I want us to see here is the intentionality that Matthew uses as he talks about these men. It says, Jesus approaches them in verse 18 because they were fishermen. Jesus chose them on purpose for they were fishermen. He chooses them on purpose because of their occupation. They were to be, Jesus says, fishers of men, which is a direct allusion to Jeremiah 16, 16 that talks about that when the kingdom comes in, God says, I am going to send for many fishermen and they will fish for them. You see, these men, their occupation was not what you would expect for it to be. Their nature is unexpected. Their very occupation is unexpected. And as you keep going through the text, you find that their calling is also unusual as well. The way that God prepares men for usefulness is through active discipleship. And as, as Jesus calls out to these men, it's not an invitation. It's an unapologetic, unconditional demand. It's, it's very unusual. He's calling them to, to leave their family and their comfort behind. I mean, this is not a very good sales pitch, right? Come and leave everything and follow me. 
And they discover here that it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them a lot. And cost them it did. Mark tells us that Zebedee's servants filled in the spots where James and John leave. On top of that, John is well-known to the high priest, and and this indicates that Zebedee was a really well-known guy, that his business was at least successful enough to have servants to fill in the gaps when the sons walked off the job. These guys are leaving a life that is made in the shade. And the emphasis in the text is on the immediacy of their response, where they immediately dropped their nets, left the boat, and their father, verse 22, and they followed him. Everything about these men and their call is extremely unusual. I mean, if your objective is to turn the world upside down, why would you choose blue-collar fishermen to drop everything and come prepare for the greatest mission impossible that the world has, has ever seen? The answer is to prove the point again that this kingdom is unlike what you'd expect it to be. Here's the takeaway. God pairs an unexpected message with unusual people. Why would he do that? Simply put, so that the glory would stay with him and never be assumed by the mouthpiece. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says it this way, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Then Paul goes on, he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. See, if you've been called by God not only to salvation, but also to the service of proclaiming his word, you've been given the greatest of privileges. And with great privilege comes great responsibility. The responsibility to recognize that the power of your ministry will always reside squarely in him through the work of his spirit and never ever in you. You see, you and I, Much like these disciples here, we were were not selected because of our nobility, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. We were not selected for our uncommon abilities or our nobility or our great intellect. You and I were not called to this work because God had some kind of inherent need and, and you were just the right person to fill it. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us that you and I were called to this work, to this ministry, for the very simple reason that God is merciful. And he's always chosen those who were unworthy. So when anything at all happens, everyone would turn and say, not what a great preacher, not what a great pastor, but instead, what a great God who does such a magnificent work. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we were all chosen with the specific intention that we might now proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, God has chosen you for a reason. And it's not to make much of you. It's so that much might be made of him. That's the way his kingdom works. He gives you an unexpected message that will be rejected. And he chooses people to spread that message who are not the people that we would expect them to be. And the same is true for us. We have the same message and we have too been chosen. But let us never forget that it is the content of that message that must be delivered so that the name of God might be glorified and not ours at any point. God works in unusual ways here. That's what we see in the second scene. In the third scene, we see Jesus undertaking his ministry in Galilee, verses 23 through 25, and we see him taking some very uncommon kinds of actions. It says in verse 23 that Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. 
And large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. What we find right away here in this scene is that the nature of Jesus' actions are really quite uncommon. Jesus, you see, didn't strut into a palace. He didn't settle down. He didn't summon his servants to do his bidding. That's not why he called the disciples in the verse immediately before. Instead, he went to Capernaum. He called together some fishermen, and he started taking action. And look at the verbs that are used there in verse 23. He is going. He is teaching. He is proclaiming. He is healing. He's going to people, explaining the truth, declaring it, and meeting their needs. This is not the normal activity of what you would expect out of the king of the Jews. Instead of going to the rich and famous and, and crushing the powerful empires of the world, instead, no, Jesus, he goes to the poor. He goes to the needy. That's where he goes. And he begins to serve their need at every level. It's not at all what we would have expected from the king of the universe to come and do. When he came, he demonstrated that he was compassionate. And the results of his actions were also then uncommon, not just the nature of them, but the results of them. We find that the news begins to grow throughout the entire extent of the Roman province of Syria. And this was a day where it was not easy to travel. You didn't just jump into your Ford Explorer and, and take your sick relative down to Henry Mayo ER. I mean, how do you get a paralytic to travel 80 miles when you have to walk the whole way? How do you corral a madman and keep him on the road? How do you chain up a demon-possessed man and drag him to the next county over? But to them, what was happening was so amazing, and it was so worth it, that people did it, and they did it in droves. And his impact continues to grow as the news continues to grow, where Jesus is comprehensively addressing all the issues amongst the people. You see there, he addresses their spiritual issues with the demoniacs, the mental issues with the epileptics, the physical issues with those who are paralyzed. I mean, he is holistically addressing all the needs that are being brought to him. And news about him begins to grow, just as he intended that it would. Why? Why is he taking these uncommon actions and why is he desirous of this news beginning to grow? The reason why is that what he is putting on display for everyone who was watching there in that region was a God who was different in every way, who was working in ways that were different, where here is a God who, who gets down into the dirt with his people and not the clean people, the filthy people, those who were hated and those who were hate-filled, those who had the greatest needs. He met them, he met them all, he filled them, he made them whole, and he ministered to those people. And the actions that he takes... They weren't like the actions for what you'd expect to see from the king of the universe. And that is the point. That God does not work in the ways we would anticipate him to work. When the king does come, not only does he come to an unexpected place and choose these unusual people, he starts to do uncommon things. Things that would not only violate their sensibilities, but also validate who he was and the message that he brought. These uncommon actions would show the distinction and the power of the kingdom that he came to present to them. But here's perhaps the greatest example of the uncommon actions that Jesus took when he came in his incarnation to earth. It's given to us in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. While we were still helpless, at the right time, God, Christ, died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But no, God, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, undeserving, filthy sinners, Christ died for us. Here's how this translates into ministry for us. Jesus gives us the command later in Matthew chapter 5, just one chapter later, verse 44 he says, you are to take the same kind of uncommon actions that he has taken and modeled for us. He says, to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You see, 
you and I, we've been called to a ministry where we too are called to do that which may seem uncommon. We are called to love those who are unlovely, to do good to those who hate us, to serve those who may have been passed over by the rest of society, and we are called to love them and love them all, to minister to them, to meet their needs, just as our Lord modeled for us. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says it this way, we urge you, brethren, come alongside everyone, he basically says, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. We're told elsewhere in Scripture that we must feed the sheep, tend the flock, care for the lambs, and that, that is dirty work. And yet if such a work was not beneath the king of glory, how could we ever possibly act as though it were beneath us. The point that Matthew's trying to make in lining up these three narratives as an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount is not just sketching out what Jesus was doing in Galilee. No, he's arranging them on purpose the way that he does. The point's very simple. It's the point that Jesus makes in nearly every verse of his great sermon in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And it's this. God does not work like you'd expect him to. And therefore, your ministry will not look like you'd expect it to. He works to accomplish his own purposes using his own means through his own people. And we are men then who are called by God to do the work of God. And therefore, this is a relevant message for us today because when the message is unexpected and countercultural, we must be faithful. When tempted to think much of yourself, remember who you are and make much of Christ instead. And when you're called to take an uncommonly difficult action, serve with a heart of joy knowing that Christ went and did it before you. Because God's ways are not your ways. And it's because of that that you and I simply have the privilege then of proclaiming his message, faithfully serving him, and loving his people.